I don't think I was born with this curse. It feels like some sort of disease I contracted at one point in my life. But maybe it developed over time. Matured in a way. Perhaps it has been there all along. Just waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Either way, I can distinctly recall my first dance with the devil as if it was yesterday. It was a few weeks after my twelfth birthday that I first felt it. As I entered our house after school one day, I knew at once that something was different. An acrid, ashen stench polluted the air which filled our home. A sticking feeling started in my nose as I went inside. I began coughing as I moved toward the kitchen, where I could hear my mother doing the dishes. It was like the air around me had suddenly been deprived of all the oxygen it should contain. Before I reached her, however, hasty images began to flash before my eyes. Horrible images that made me stop dead in my tracks. Flames of fire and a thick smoke. My mother's bedroom engulfed in roaring flames. The thick red morning robe she so often wore was now black and began to peel off. Her face appeared through the smoke, contorted into a scream of pain. As I continued to watch, tears fell from her bleeding eyes. And then, nothing. As soon as the images had come, they disappeared. I was left in a state of shock and fear I can't fully describe. My lip was trembling. My stomach felt like it was about to exit my body altogether. At the time, I couldn't make sense of it all, unsure of what had really happened. The visions came again and again, more brutal each time, and the smell and coughing around my mother never dissipated, only intensified. I not only smelled and saw my mother's pain, but in the last one, I could feel it, like it was my own body which burned in the hot flames. Two months from my first vision, I understood. That horrible day stuck forever in my memory when me and my father went on a boys only trip to my grandparents. That day confirmed my suspicions I wished wouldn't come true. The investigation blamed faulty wiring. That she had been trapped in her room with no means to escape. Perhaps she burned alive in the roaring flames. Maybe she suffocated by the intense smoke. Whatever the cause, we were mine as a mother, a wife, a house, and my childhood innocence. The visions, smells and sounds started to come more and more after the death of my mother. My father's presence began to give me a slight headache, growing with each year. In the background of the headache, I heard a low, steady beeping. I had many guesses throughout the years, but ultimately it turned out to be an aneurysm which claimed my father's life in his late fifties. Losing one parent early clearly wasn't enough. Being in class had turned from a great opportunity of preparation for the future to a literal living hell. 
all around me. I could see, hear and smell the deaths of all my classmates. Some of the kids around me barely gave me anything to make a reading on, which made me happy and grateful. This meant that these people would live long lives with their deaths miles away. Others almost made me vomit. The girl with a ponytail next to me in class radiated a bitter, sour smell of urine and something at the time couldn't determine. Alcohol poisoning is a bitch apparently, as she three years later would drink a bit too much at the party she threw for her best friend whilst her parents were out of town. She didn't even make it to the hospital before she was declared dead. Then there were those who attacked my mind in other ways. Like the guy behind me, who always gave me a headache, like my father. However, its cause was not an oncoming aneurysm, but a terrible rap song. It was hard to concentrate on what he said while talking to him, thanks to the loud lyrics rampaging in my head. By the end of the school year, I had memorized it all the way. Years later, I heard from a friend that he had overdosed on cocaine out of desperation since his girlfriend had left him for another. He had done it inside his apartment, blasting that god-awful rap song. The most common signs I received from the rest of my classmates were heart pains, headaches and trouble breathing in various degrees. I came to realize that these symptoms predicted heart attacks, strokes and lung disease in their later years. These people were the ones I stuck around with all the way through middle school, both because their presence didn't unleash a gag response in me and since they would stick around for a long time. I never did get over my mother's sudden death. In the beginning, I told people their future, as well as I could. Both because I felt I needed to ventilate this curse onto others in a way. But also to make me more popular in a sense. Children sure are funny in that way. But they just laughed it off. And in time, I learned that people don't really want to know. Well, of course, if they have many years left on this earth and die something common and natural, it was no big deal. But how do you tell someone they soon will die? Maybe in a car crash during summer break, like my math teacher, who had fallen asleep behind the wheel and caught the side of an oncoming bus. The foreboding of death consistently gave me a hard time hearing his lectures all semester. Or, perhaps like my best friend from kindergarten, who would step into oncoming traffic one morning and get run over by a careless trucker. That one hurt the most, I must say. And then, there are the suicides and murders. Like the same friend's mother, who would later put a gun into her mouth, weeks after her son's tragic accident out of sorrow. Or the plump lady in the cafeteria, who would receive multiple stab wounds. Thanks for that, by the way. I went without breakfast every day because of that. So, I began to keep all the secrets to myself. And for those who might wonder, no, it can't be changed. Believe me when I say that I've tried. It turns out, fate really is set in stone. Further down the road, in high school, 
where I met my best friend, who immediately gave away that he would die of lung disease. Not only because I felt it as soon as I shook his hand, in the way my breathing changed and the coughing slowly began, but also because his other hand held a half-smoked cigarette. We grew tight over the next few months, and my concern for his health rose. I began to convince him to quit, told him that it was bad for him, that he could die from it. My pleads eventually bore fruit, and I really thought I had cheated the system. I thought I had saved a life. That was until a later was admitted to the hospital due to a lung tumor, apparently unnoticed for several years. Last April he died, with me right by his side. After that, it was hard for me to connect with people. The deaths of family members, friends and others occupied my mind at all times. It all felt hopeless, and it was hard for me to live a normal life. I couldn't feel the shock like everyone else when a relative unexpectedly passed away. People began to wonder if I even felt anything, which of course I did. I felt it so much more than anyone else. Eventually, after years of this disease, I learned to ignore most inputs that people gave me. A cough, chest pains and foul smells around me became normal. I could at will see those deaths I wished to see, for the most part at least. Only the loud and messy deaths really broke through. I remember a guy at the front row in my psychology course in college. I would always try to avoid this short guy with the glasses who always seemed to have all the answers the professor asked for. Being around him was deafening. A loud ringing inside my ears would be accommodated by pain all over my body. It was so bad that it forced me to sit at the far back of the lecture hall. It was completely impossible for me to even walk by him in class without me covering my ears in pain. The answer for this guy's fate was revealed two years later when his body was shipped back overseas from Iraq. He was awarded the Medal of Honor for his heroic doing, throwing himself over a live grenade. Despite his annoying presence, I eventually got my degree in psychology and started looking through my options. I could stay here, in this rather small town, and play it safe, with my family's presence close at all time. Or go big. I chose the ladder and booked a flight for London the very next week. Packing my bags and saying goodbye to everyone went surprisingly fast, and the day quickly arrived. My aunt was kind enough to give me a ride to the airport, and we went without any hassle. As I exited the vehicle, excited for this new, thrilling journey, she called me back, put her hand on my shoulder and said, Are you really sure about this? Her voice broke at the end of the question, but she didn't look away. My aunt had in a way actually become my new mom, after both of my parents' deaths. London. It's a really big place, and awfully far away, she continued. If you run into any problems, I won't be able to be there for you, as I would be if you were to stay here. She ended the sentence with a firm squeeze. 
I quickly reassured her and told her that I had everything under control and that there would be no problems. I then gave her a last hug and hurried inside with my bags stacked on top of each other on a big stroller. Oh, how wrong I was. The check-in went quite fast, which I was thankful for. I was one of the last who would board this flight, and I knew the flight might be hard on me. So many people would sit close together. I was grateful that it didn't have to start just yet. I walked past the cute girl at the check-in after easing my burden by dropping off my many bags. I gave her a short smile as I passed, mostly out of pity, since her life would end in a great fall towards hard, unforgiving water, and then a big smack. Most likely suicide, unfortunately. Perhaps due to boyfriend drama. But who am I to speculate? I then waited the last minutes for the flight to arrive, by myself, in a corner, listening to my iPod. As I record this, I am tens of thousands of feet up in the air, passing over the Atlantic Ocean and gliding toward my future. I should be filled with happiness, excitement and nervousness. But all I can feel is dread and fear and pain, a lot of pain. Whatever I had imagined beforehand was nothing compared to this. I had expected the usual chest pains and coughs, but what I received instead was terrifying. The fat man with large earbuds next to me makes it hard for me to breathe at all. Not because of the smell of his Cheetos, which fills the whole cabin, but because of water. A lot of water filling my throat. I have met someone who had drowned before, but nothing like this. It was by far one of the most terrifying ways to go. The mother of the child, who keeps kicking my seat behind me, will also die of drowning, while her son will perish to a hard bang to his head. I continually rub the place he will be hit, and bits over the forehead. As I sense the rest of the people around me, I realize that nearly all will die due to either drowning or a large hit to the head. And not in a few years, but soon, very soon. The old gentleman in front of me will die of some kind of heart disease, but I can only hope that it won't be too soon, out of shock of the inevitable. The captain now informs us of unexpected turbulence. I suppose I should put my seatbelt on and prepare. Prepare for my future. <laughs>